Thanks for your interest in, uh, in this topic. Effective altruism, philanthropy as a for-profit endeavor, and I'll shortly delve into what that means, for-profit thinking and charity, how that can be uh, meaningfully combined. Um, yeah, let's start off with a definition of uh, what effective altruism is. It's a practical philosophy and social movement, which you may have heard of, that uses empirical evidence and reason to determine the most effective ways to benefit others in global society. Now, that may sound good, but it doesn't tell us that much, um, of course. Um, in any case, there are two conceptual components, altruism and effectiveness. Altruism is essentially um, the conceptual opposite of, of egoism. So it means that we're sort of practically oriented in our action towards helping others as well and not just considering our um, self-interest. And effectiveness means that we're trying to, of course, optimally achieve our goals, including our altruistic goals. So we're trying to maximize the probability of, uh, of goal achievement. Um, now, why should we be altruistic at all, one might wonder. I mean, in economics, there's also, I mean, there are various uh, prevalent theories, of course, but um, there's a big strand, at least in, uh, in, in Western economics, saying, well, you know, we should be selfish, uh, utility maximizers, so that might raise the question, why be altruistic at all? Why be interested in, in, in benefiting others too? And there are various uh, thought experiments and arguments to, to justify um, this practical orientation. So imagine you're in uh, the unfortunate position of a firefighter faced with two buildings, uh, two burning buildings, one big, one small, and let's say there are a hundred people being trapped at the moment in the big building and uh, just one person being trapped in the small building. And you also receive the information that unfortunately it won't be possible to save all of these people. So you have to, you're faced with this moral dilemma. You either um, can save these 100 people in the big building or the one person in the small building. That's the moral dilemma you're in. And you know, for simplicity, let's say that you have like, in either case, a 100% uh, success probability. So you'll succeed. Uh, at saving these 100 or the one person, depending on the choice you make. Now, of course, there's always a third option as well. If you're the firefighter, you could just decide to, to go have a beer instead and, um, and not be bothered with uh, the situation. So this would be the non-altruistic choice, of course. And uh, yeah, maybe the selfish choice, the purely selfish choice, just go have a beer and ignore the moral catastrophe, the suffering and the imminent deaths there. Um, but, you know, if, if we agree that three is not an option, as um, most people do when faced with moral catastrophe, then, yeah, we need to choose between one and two. And, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a tragic, it's a sad choice because somebody is going to suffer and die anyway. But it seems that clearly in such a situation we would opt for the lesser evil. And the lesser evil here seems to be saving the 100 and not the one. So here we'd probably go for uh, option one and save uh, 100 people. And um, this, so if, if we agree sort of with the background reasoning here, then um, that's an argument for two things. One, that we don't just have selfish or self-interested goals. We have at least some altruistic goals as well, at least in situations of moral catastrophe. And two, we care about the numbers. So when helping others, it doesn't just matter that we are helping. It does also matter that we try and help um, the greatest possible number of people. And there are further arguments, which you also may have heard of, um, originating in, in practical philosophy. This is a drowning child thought experiment going back to uh, philosopher Peter Singer. So imagine you're walking past a lake or a shallow pond and you realize that a child, a small child, is drowning in there. Um, you look around and you can't see any parents or anyone else that would be willing and able to help. And you realize that this child's life depends on what you do now. So you can walk into that pond or that lake and just save the child. There are no complications, no risks or dangers involved to yourself. Um, so you could just walk in and save a life. Well, it's not entirely true. There is a little complication. And it's the following. You're wearing 
pretty expensive clothes and expensive shoes. Maybe you're, you happen to be on uh, your way to an important meeting. Let's say uh, your expensive suit and shoes cost whatever, a total amount of $1,000. And you realize that you know, if, if you're now running or jumping into that pond and lake at no risk to yourself, you're going to ruin the clothes and the shoes. Let's also assume that there will be no replacement, so you'll just have to buy a new suit and new shoes for $1,000. So then the question is, would you save the life um, under these circumstances in that situation or would you not? Um, unsurprisingly, the vast majority of people say uh, they would save the life, of course, if they didn't really existentially need these $1,000. Of course, you can construct a situation where you're like, yeah, I'm going to be starving if I'll have to, you know, uh, spend $1,000 in addition to what I'm spending anyway. But you know, if, if you're still going to be comfortably off, if that's just going to mean um, a little less luxury in your life, then most people say, yeah, in that case, it's really a no-brainer that I would save the life. And this also shows that we do indeed, or most people do indeed, have important altruistic goals as well. And they would be willing to sacrifice quite a bit of money in order to achieve these altruistic goals, to reduce the suffering of others and save the life of others, at least if that doesn't put themselves in, in sort of an existentially very uncomfortable or dangerous um, situation. But so if we follow the reasoning behind these two uh, thought experiments, the firefighter and the drowning child, um, that may have pretty significant practical implications because we can then ask, well, okay, now we do know that there are also burning buildings out there. There's a lot of suffering out there. A lot of people are dying, maybe from, from preventable causes that we could do something about. So let's say if we have on our bank account a thousand dollars or, uh, you know, maybe many times as much that we could donate and we would still be comfortably off. Um, why don't we do it? So, I mean, if, if, it's, if it's a no-brainer to save the drowning child in that situation, then one can ask, well, wouldn't it also be just equally rational and a no-brainer actually to donate a lot more if we're not already doing it? And then, of course, try and figure out, yeah, where this money could go uh, the longest way, because it's important to save as many people as possible, as we saw in the first thought experiment. And that's precisely what the effective altruism movement is trying to do. Of course, if we follow the spirit of these thought experiments, then one action point is, yeah, trying to check out the, the material, the philosophical material, the scientific, the economic, the empirical material on strategic do-gooding. Um, where should we donate? our time or our money if um, we want to make a difference, then one standard action point um, within the effective altruism movement has been trying to donate at least 10% of one's income. Now, when I first heard of this idea, donate 10% of my income, I was like, yeah, but that's like a lot. And yes, I do have altruistic goals, but I'm not a moral saint. Um, isn't this too much of a challenge? Isn't this sort of over demanding? But then when you actually reason about it more and check out um, the happiness psychology and happiness economics behind it, many people conclude that yes, you know, it's quite unlikely. So if, if you live in a, in a rich country and earn a good salary, it's quite likely that, that you'd be worse off uh, when donating 10% uh, of your income each month. And quite the opposite, there's quite solid happiness economic and happiness psychological research suggesting that donations often tend to make the donors happier as well. So it can be a win-win. And this is why many effective altruists have um, decided to donate at least 10% um, of their income. And uh, yeah, it's quite astounding what can be achieved in this way. So currently on a global level, there are a few thousand people at least uh, that strongly identify with effective altruism. I mean maybe already tens of thousands that maybe loosely identify with the tenets, but a few thousand that have decided to donate 10% or more and have taken a pledge. This pledge is not legally binding, but it's sort of personally and maybe socially binding, a pledge to donate 10% over a lifetime. And in aggregate, these pledges are already worth uh, several, several billion dollars in sort of promised donations and these donations are now happening. So it seems possible and the movement is, is only just starting essentially. So it seems possible to, to compete with, uh, with billionaires actually with uh, this strategy, even if, if we're not billionaires ourselves. Um, the other main action point is that effective altruists, of course, don't just try 
to donate money, but also time. Um, there is an organization called 80,000 Hours, which provides career advice to people interested in making as much of an altruistic difference as possible. On average, we work about 80,000 hours uh, in our lifetime. And of course, it's both in terms of the personal stakes and in terms of the stakes for the world at large, the altruistic stakes. This is a huge decision. What are we going to do with these um, 80,000 hours? And it turns out that sort of standard traditional um, career advice that um, people have been receiving if they were interested in making an altruistic difference isn't very useful or very rational. So, I mean, if you, if you poll people and ask them for examples of like standardly altruistic careers, many would, for instance, say doctor, doctor in uh, the developing world. That's like a standard intuition. But if you think about that, if the goal is to make as much of a difference as possible, you need to work on something that wouldn't happen otherwise. So if you take the job of a doctor, and if it's the case that if you had not taken that job, somebody else would be doing it, then maybe you're not making much of a counter di counterfactual difference, actually. And in some cases, it can be a much better strategy to, say, uh, decide to go and earn as much money as possible and then give quite a large fraction of that for instance, in order to enable several other people to become doctors in uh, developing countries. So with that sort of strategy, often called earning to give, it could be possible to make a much bigger counterfactual difference and also to multiply one's impact. And of course, that's just one consideration. These considerations could go in either direction. It depends on what the biggest bottlenecks are. I mean, if, if money isn't a big bottleneck, then probably earning to give won't be uh, that promising a strategy, so it, it, it depends on the specifics, of course. But it turns out that traditional altruistic career advice um, often isn't very useful. Now, another question, of course, is, well, what are the biggest, um, metaphorically speaking, burning buildings out there? Um, a traditional focus of do-gooders has been just turning to local problems, problems in, uh, in our own society. And there are sayings like charity begins at home and so on. Um, but if we strive to make the biggest possible difference, that's not a very plausible focus area because at least if we live in, if in, in rich and developed countries, it's, it's quite hard to actually save a life for say a few thousand dollars and, and most of the time totally impossible. So if we look into our healthcare systems, it usually takes several hundred thousand dollars in order to, to save a life. And healthcare economics uh, can calculate that pretty precisely. But because of this dynamic of diminishing marginal utility of money, it's, it tends to be a lot easier to save lives and reduce uh, suffering and advance society in poorer countries. So um, a more plausible focus area would, for instance, be looking to the refugee crisis. I mean, and we can roughly uh, look at the, at the victim counts, people that are suffering. Turns out about 50 or 60 million people are currently categorized as, as refugees. But it seems that there are much bigger burning buildings still. For instance, global poverty, extreme poverty, still affects about 800 million people. The standard definition is of, of extreme global poverty is an individual living on less than $2 per day. That's purchasing power parity, of course. And that means, usually means permanent undernourishment, um, suffering from diseases that are actually totally treatable because you can't afford any, any medical treatment and so on. So global poverty and health is, is a really big um, burning building, as it were, a really big cause area. Um, another sort of general cause area uh, that effective altruists tend to be interested in is, is global catastrophic risks. Because of course when we're dealing with risks of a potentially global scale, well, literally everybody on earth could be affected and not just the present generation but also all future generations. That's also an, a consideration important to many effective altruists. So if we think that the numbers count, the, the victim counts are important, then um, it seems that, at least if civilization goes on, most of the people that will ever live 
will of course live in, in the future. So, and this could then lead to an argument of the sort, well, of course the present generation is, is intrinsically important and certainly very instrumentally important, but all the future generations taken together could, could be ex enormously and overwhelmingly uh, important if there's ways to positively um, affect their well-being. Um, and of course some global catastrophic risks are environmental, some are political, international warfare say, some are technological, and there's also of course an overlapping area between all of these. I mean nuclear war, of course, at the intersection of technology and international politics. Um, but there are technological risks of various kinds and also some stemming from our action or our omission. So for instance, one cause area some effective altruists are interested in is, is biotechnology in general. So biosecurity, of course here there are global risks from just harmful action. Yeah? If you consider synthetic biology, the, the possibility uh, to create artificial, artificially create bacteria or viruses that could cause pandemics. Um, so that, that's certainly a risk. But then some risk also could sort of stem from our omission, our failure to advance certain technologies. Um, a broad cause area some effective altruists are interested in is transhumanism, also thinking about the human condition from a far future perspective, a biologically informed perspective. Um, and some sub-cause area there is trying to fight and ultimately eliminate aging, for instance. So if we take a far, if you take a far future perspective, and let's say it's, it's techno technologically possible to sort of fight diseases and the diseases of old age, to a point where we're really no longer aging in a meaningful uh, biological sense. So if that is possible, it seems like if we take sufficient technological action to bring it about, that could be a huge benefit. And in a sense, maybe, of course, you know, that's a, that's a separate long discussion to what extent our biological condition also represents a catastrophe in a way. But this is a case where technology, of course, you know, through the advancement of medicine has already brought us huge benefits and where failure to act now to invest in the right kinds of maybe sort of very visionary and utopian research could also mean that certain catastrophes go on for longer than would be necessary. So eliminating aging as maybe a speculative but a cause area that some effective altruists have been um, interested in. Another cause area is animal suffering. I mean this is also like a long philosophical and empirical uh, debate. But, uh, so if we suppose that animals are conscious too, can suffer as well, and if, say, intelligence is not super relevant for, for moral status, and that seems to be what we believe for humans. I mean, we're, when humans are concerned, we're usually not saying, well, you know, these humans, say children, small children, are less intelligent, therefore their suffering matters less. If we're not going to go for such an argument, then we might reason, well, okay, you know, animals might be far less intelligent than we are, but if there's good evidence that they can suffer as well, their numbers are also enormous, um, and maybe there's something we can do to, uh, to reduce their suffering as well. So some effective altruists have taken that perspective and, and are therefore trying to, uh, to do effective work in that cause area. And there's more cause areas, of course, but that's just a rough overview. And um, as you can see, unsurprisingly, I mean, the world is a hugely complex place, um, especially also when it comes to trying to improve it. So that's just sort of one consideration. What are the biggest um, burning buildings? But then, of course, if we want to know more precisely and more specifically what the highest impact opportunities are for us specifically, more considerations will be relevant. So scope of the problem, that sort of the size of the burning building is just one, uh, one relevant consideration. I mean, another consideration, needless to say, is the solvability or the tractability of a problem. So if you have like two problems, one big, one small, and if it turns out that the big problem is just not solvable, not realistically solvable, then, well, yes, you know, working on it won't be effective. And it could be more effective to work on a smaller problem with high solvability. So that's definitely another um, relevant consideration. Um, a third one is neglect in society. And this is based on the sort of economic assumption that activist resources, so donation of time, donations of time and money, also tend to have diminishing uh, marginal returns. So if, if, say, you're one of the very, f if there's a big problem out there in society and you're, you happen to be one of the first people to help address it, 
then the chance is much higher that you're going to be able to make a big difference, that maybe you're going to be able to make contributions of time and money, of ideas, uh, that wouldn't happen otherwise. But if the problem isn't highly neglected in society, so if there are already uh, huge numbers of people addressing it, both in civil society and in politics, maybe in research, and you're just one additional person there contributing money or time, then the probability, of course, will be much lower that you're going to make um, a huge difference that wouldn't happen otherwise. So neglect in society is definitely another relevant um, consideration. Last but not least, personal fit and comparative advantage also of groups and organizations and then of individuals is, is relevant as well. So, I mean, yeah, if you have like a big problem that's highly solvable and neglected in society, but it's just a very bad fit, you don't really have any like required skill, you can't really make uh, huge contributions to that problem, maybe it's still better to work on something else. So that's definitely also um, an important consideration, your interests, your skills, um, your motivation, of course, you know, if, if, if you're an effective altruist, a, a core thing to work on is also minimizing the probability that you're going to burn out at some point, because that, that would, of course, hurt your impact big time. So all of these should factor into the overall assessment, and that can, of course, get um, hugely complex, but also very interesting. Um, now let's zoom in into specific cause areas and, uh, and look at some more examples and also then specific data that enables us to make uh, cost effectiveness and impact evaluations. Um, in terms of global health, of course that's strongly related to, to general global poverty, um, there are various diseases that affect a huge number and kill a huge number uh, of people every year and every day. So for instance, the, the so-called big three, malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, kill many more people each and every day than say political violence and oppression and warfare has tended to kill in a year. Now that's another thing of course, I mean I, I'm not saying that political action can't be effective, I mean quite the opposite. So I mean even in terms of trying to fix global health, Ultimately, if, if, if you can sort of go for concerted political action, systemic action, that can be hugely effective. There are also risks to that. But it does seem like many do-gooders do seem to sort of prematurely jump into politics because that's been a traditional focus. Yeah, we, knew, we need to address something politically or we need to address specifically political problems. But actually, if we just look at the victim counts, it's not obvious that this should be the focus. So. As I mentioned, if we consider uh, these big diseases, the victim count at least has, has tended to be much higher. Um, the solvability is also seems very high, at least in principle. Uh, the medical technological um, solvability or preventability, very high in principle. That's also often like a huge complication with politics. It's, it's so messy and it's unclear whether your campaign will succeed and so on. Neglect in society also comparatively high, so of course a lot of money is going into medical research, but the bulk of the money is going into research that aims to address diseases that are prevalent in Western societies, in rich societies. Why? Well, one reason is that you can make a huge profit there because you're going to sell the treatment to people in rich countries. Whereas it's much harder to make a great profit addressing malaria, which uh, predominantly affects uh, the poorest people. But in terms of achieving our altruistic goals, if we care about helping as many people as possible, um, this can be a, a, a great focus area, of course, you know, trying to address just um, the diseases that tend to affect the poorest of the poor. Um, now, interestingly, empirical studies, empirical data shows that there are massive differences in cost effectiveness, so in terms of amount of life saved, amount of suffering reduced, between global health, different global health um, interventions. And um, so the title of the talk said that effective altruism is sort of trying to approach um, altruism and charity in a for-profit way. And I didn't mean to say that we're attempting to make a monetary profit, not at all. But it's sort of the mindset of trying to maximize something, maximize a profit. But here, of course, the profit is being defined in terms of life saved and suffering reduced. And interestingly, this hasn't really been the traditional focus of charity because in traditional charity, what gets emphasized is sort of more the emotional side of it, right? I mean, maybe you have a relative that died from cancer and of course that affects you deeply emotionally, 
and very legitimately, of course, and then you're emotionally moved with your sort of immediate compassion to do something about that. And uh, effective altruism isn't trying to counter that. It's just saying, yes, let's take our compassion, let's take our emotions, let's take our heart, but let's also combine that with our head, with our rationality, our optimization power, that we are, of course, standardly applying when it comes to, you know, actual for-profit investments, you know, in, in terms of monetary and personal profit now, when we're investing there for monetary profit, it's totally obvious that, of course, we're going to in be interested in the data and we're, we're going to be highly interested to know, well, you know, if, if I'm going to invest into that particular option, what's the probability of success and so on, how much am I going to achieve? And this is precisely the kind of mindset that effective altruism tries to apply to the domain of altruism and charity as well. Let's look at um, HIV, for instance. So this is uh, data from the World Health Organization. We have like various interventions that uh, one could go for, antiretroviral therapy, condom distribution, treatment, and then uh, at the bottom, prevention through education for high-risk groups and mass media education. And you can see the estimated impacts based on uh, randomized controlled trials in many cases can, ver can vary a lot. As you can also see by like the, the varying shades of the bars, um, the uncertainty is also quite huge. So these shades there um, and the fainter part, that represents the uncertainty, the intervals that we should probably rationally have based on the studies. So the uncertainty is huge, but we can also see that despite this uncertainty, which we should of course factor in, the expected differences in, in impact are still enormous. And so if we follow the initial thought experiment of the firefighter and agree that the numbers count in altruism as well, then of course it's crucial to factor this information in when making donation choices. Another example is mala malaria prevention. And uh, this is actually a, a cause area or sub-cause area that does particularly well, tends to do better at least at the moment. I mean, this can also change, you know, based on the situation on the ground changing, the available evidence changing. Uh, but malaria prevention is a standard intervention that's currently recommended by effective altruist organizations in the space of uh, world poverty and global health. So with organizations such as the Against Malaria Foundation, you can distribute, purchase, distribute one bed net for just $5. And this is going to protect two people that can then sleep under these nets. And this offers really strong protection. Of course, most infections happen at night when, when people are sleeping. And uh, yes, in, in many, many randomized, dozens of uh, randomized control trials, which is really good evidence. I mean, this is not physics, of course. So it's not a hard science by uh, any standard. But uh, it's, I mean, this is backed by really good evidence, uh, comparatively really good evidence in that space. Um, and so, yeah, of course, if you scale up these numbers, if you donate 100K, uh, then you can protect 40K people. That means many villages or like a whole football stadium, say. And donating 100K is quite easy for most people, actually, in, <coughs> in uh, Western in rich societies. I mean, you don't need to donate 100K in one go, but you can maybe if you donate 5K a year, well, then you're going to get up there if you donate 10K a year anyway. Um, and so it's quite amazing what we can actually do, even just, just as individuals. Um, the estimated cost per life year saved is, is just $150 with that kind of intervention. So it's pretty amazing. With a, with a donation of $150 that doesn't affect many or most people in rich societies at all, we can actually give a poor person one more healthy year of life. And then, of course, yeah, we can calculate, of course, based on that, the cost, the average cost of saving a whole life. Now, of course, strictly speaking, we can't save a life at the moment because everybody is going to die. So we'll, we'll need uh, the abolition of aging there through biotechnology. Um, but what healthcare economists do is this, they, they talk about what the cost of one life saved uh, as equivalent to saving 30 years of healthy life. So that's usually what healthcare uh, economists mean when they say saving a life. So 30 years. But yeah, this is the rough cost here um, for one year, one healthy year of life. Um, there are various organizations doing sort of in-depth charity research, um, collecting data, analyzing it, um, doing the relevant calculations. 
And uh, yeah, the leading organization currently there is GiveWell, givewell.org. And uh, yes, they are extremely transparent. You can check out all of their research um, on the website if you're interested. And they're coming up with top recommendations for where to donate based on their calculations every year. And of course, there's some fluctuations if the evidence changes. Um, Generally speaking, global health seems to be a really promising cause area because there are these huge medical short-run benefits. And then, as some studies suggest, of course, there also tend to be long-run societal benefits. Um, so one randomized con controlled trial suggested that kids that were able to sleep under bed nets and were protected from malaria later on tended to, tended to earn uh, they missed much fewer school days and later on, for instance, tended to earn 20% more than kids that didn't have the privilege to sleep under these um, bed nets. And another advantage is that, I mean, these are some worries that are often discussed in these debates. Well, you know, but in terms of development aid, of course, there have been many failures as well. So many people are, and actually rightly so, quite cynical about the impact of development aid. And indeed, there have been many failures, but I'd say, well, that's just an additional argument for effective altruism, for like being serious about the data and trying to figure out what actually helps and what may harm people. So even if we believe that sort of all of the uh, development aid, maybe also the state-sponsored development aid that's coming from Western societies was like maybe net neutral or maybe even net negative, just statistically speaking, there must be at least some interventions that are positive, right? So if we assume that all of the interventions that we've sponsored in terms of development aid were like net neutral, then probably there's some distribution where some interventions are like harmful, many are neutral-ish, and some are really good. And what effective altruism is about is sort of trying to find and isolate the really good ones and scale them up. And of course, you know, an advantage of working in health is that this seems to be like maybe the paradigm example of a universal good. I mean, even if people's cultural preferences vary a lot and people's conceptions of the good life vary a lot, well, you know, everybody needs to be healthy in order to achieve any other goal. So this is kind of a, of a universal good that seems safe to promote. Um, now, taking this further, what about uncertainty and risk? I mean, yes, it's totally legitimate to ask, well, you know, what's the probability that a certain anti-poverty intervention fails to have the intended effect, or maybe there's even a probability that it will have a harmful effect. Uh, and of course, we should factor that in as well. And we can start, you know, at least in theory, to address that sort of issue by modifying the initial thought experiments. I mean, what, what if you have like a 50% probability to save a drowning child? You know, you know that Maybe you're not going to make it in time, time is short, maybe the child will still die despite your effort. I mean, in that case, if the situation is, you know, either not do anything or do something and have a 50% chance of success, or even maybe just a 10% chance of saving that life, we will probably still say, yeah, it's worth it. And then, of course, we can further, we can introduce further complications. What if we have, let's say, an 80% chance to save the life? but a 1% chance to cause harm in some way. Maybe there are other children around and maybe we would, whatever, you know, unintentionally push a child into the lake or whatever. I mean, complications could happen with harmful unintended side effects. And then, if, and then we can try and reason, okay, under what circumstances, with what probability distributions would we still go for it? And uh, we can also uh, consider dilemmas like, what if we have a 10% chance to save 100 lives? versus a 100% chance to save five. What would you do? What should you do? And um, what are the thresholds, maybe? So maybe we could start with a 100% probability to save a certain number, go down to 90% and compare it to, a to another pos decision possibility. And a standard framework for addressing um, this kind of situation is the expected value framework. So just taking the probability times the stakes. So here, 10% chance times 100 versus 100% uh, chance, so 1 times 5. And the expected value here would recommend the first option, so 0 0.1 times 100 uh, equals 10. But of course, we could ask, well, but shouldn't we be risk averse at least a bit? Doesn't risk aversion make sense? So if we have a 100% probability to save 5 versus just a 10% chance to save 100, 
we might feel uneasy about going for the 10% option. I mean, one reply is, if that's not a one-shot game, but if many people do the same, or if you do the same many times over, well then, you know, uh, due to the law of large numbers, of course you are going to save more people in fact, if you go for the highest expected value. Uh, so that's one reply. Um, but yeah, even if it's one shot, I think a pretty good case can be made here for going for risk neutrality, so expected value as opposed to some risk averse function. I think our risk aversion comes from our being accustomed to thinking about decision situations that are about earning money or making money for personal utility. And if, it's, if, if, if we're about making money for personal utility, then risk aversion seems to make perfect sense. Why? Because money tends to have diminishing marginal utility, at least uh, in terms of personal gain. So the first $10,000 that you earn per year are hugely important. They enable you to survive. The second 20K that you add are a bit less important and so on and so forth. So that's the, that seems to be the dynamic when it comes to personal gain. But that same argument doesn't seem to apply when it comes to altruism because there, yeah, if you save the first life, great. If you save the second one, it's not like the second one is less valuable. It's similarly valuable to the person uh, themselves. And so if we're being altruistic, I think we should not, we should not assume that, there are dimin that there's diminishing marginal utility there. And so this kind of argument for risk aversion does no longer apply. So I would probably argue for uh, going for expected value maximization when it comes to um, altruism and taking the probability times the stakes. And this leads to a concept that uh, effective altruists call hits-based philanthropy or hits-based giving. I mean, let's consider an example in the 20th century, it's again from the health area. Smallpox killed more than 300 million people up to its eradication in the 70s. So a huge evil in terms of the consequences. That's more than all wars, all genocides, all political violence and famines combined. So an insane uh, victim count. But we were able to beat it and have since saved an estimated 60 to 120, some uncertainty there, 60 to 120 million lives since the eradication. And so f there's a pretty interesting and, and complex story behind uh, how that happened. And ex ante, it also seemed quite unlikely to succeed. You know, many people were saying, no, it's, these are crazy plans, not going to succeed in terms of smallpox eradication. But the point is, if the stakes are so high, then even if the success chance is very low, the expected value can still be enormous. And it, it can be extremely worthwhile to pursue something that's most likely to fail. So you're pursuing a plan, deliberately pursuing an altruistic plan that's most likely to fail, maybe only has a 5% success, cha success chance. But because the stakes are so high, the expected value can still be enormous. And so that's uh, the concept of sort of hits-based giving, trying to do maybe many things at once, trying to have various individuals and various groups, organizations work on such situations of low probability and of success and high stakes. Of course, the for-profit analogy, again, is his hit space investment. I mean, you can do that with your investment portfolio. Uh, it's, if, if, you have, if you're pursuing many such situations or opportunities at once with like low success probability but high stakes, that's also a form of hedging, needless to say, due to law of large numbers again. And um, this concept can be transferred to, to philanthropy in very productive ways. Now, some applications um, of hits-based giving are to be found specifically in the cause area of global catastrophic risks. Some of them being the worst case climate change scenarios, which might be like, you know, sort of really extreme global chaos and uh, maybe even some extinction risk, but that seems, I mean, climate change seems pretty bad, but the absolute worst case scenarios seem pretty unlikely. But still, the stakes are enormous. Maybe nuclear war seems unlikely, at least on, a, on an extinction um, level scale, but the stakes, again, extreme. Biosecurity, maybe unlikely, but it's not clear. I mean, I'm, I'm also not claiming that with these risks, the situation is necessar necessarily uh, of the sort that the risk is low probability. I mean, if the risk is high probability, then we should be addressing it all the more. But the argument is, even if the risk is low probability, and even if our success chance of doing something to mitigate the risk is also low, 
the expected value of trying hard can still be pretty high. And uh, a further cause area that some effective altruists have been thinking about and researching is um, artificial intelligence, opportunities and risks from a possible transition to uh, superhuman intelligence and how to maybe steer um, such a transition to maximize the benefits. And in order to conclude, let's zoom in on this cause area briefly. Um, I should maybe premise it by saying that I'm not myself an, uh, an AI expert. I'm a trained philosopher and uh, have done a lot of entrepreneurship. And if you're interested in uh, what the AI experts in effective altruism have to say more specifically, then uh, I'd encourage you to check out the organizations and the websites that I'll mention at the end. So this will just be a brief um, intro and philosophical overview. Um, so many technical experts do seem to predict the emergence of artificial superintelligence. So machines that outperform humans in literally every uh, domain of cognitive interest uh, later this century. That seems to be a prediction that many technical experts are uh, willing to make. And of course, if that materializes, it's likely to be a change that's more disruptive on a global scale than the evolutionary sort of ape to human transition has been. And this has been an extremely disruptive transition, of course. So the transition from ape-like brains to human brains. I mean, up to the point where, you know, the goal achievement and the very survival of apes, of chimps, depends a lot more on us humans than it depends on them. So if artificial superintelligence or superintelligences emerge, and I mean, you know, there are various scenarios, maybe there will also be like a, a corresponding enhancement of our human brains, various scenarios there that are possible. But I mean, then it's, yes, it seems quite likely that our goal achievement and our very survival would depend more on, uh, on these superintelligences than it would depend on us. And this raises the question, well, um, will these AI's goals be stably aligned with our goals or not? And it seems that if they are, if they are stably aligned with our goals, then that could be the biggest opportunity for humanity ever. I mean, of course, uh, technological progress has brought humanity a great many benefits, and this could sort of be the ultimate benefit. Um, maybe the last invention we need to make. And in principle, it could solve all our problems because the tool that we have been using, of course, in history to solve problems is our intelligence. And if we end up with a human, uh, with a superhuman intelligence that's beneficial, uh, meaning uh, that's pursuing goals that are identical with ours, uh, goals that we'd consider good and valuable, uh, then that could be, yes, really the biggest uh, opportunity for humanity ever. But there could also be some risks, namely if um, these superintelligences goals are not aligned or not stably aligned. I mean, it could also be the case that they are aligned at first, but then sort of uh, because there's further developments become misaligned, that could also be a problem. So there could also be the risks, the risk that we're going to be faced with a kind of superintelligent power that's not stably goal aligned with us. So it seems that this transition could be extremely disruptive. The, the, the stakes could be enormous, literally th the biggest stakes ever. And depending on whether um, goal alignment will be the case, the outcome could be extremely good or quite dangerous. And that's basically the problem context that many effective altruists have been thinking about. Now, from a sort of more philosophical, non-technical point of view, also in the public debate, uh, some people have been like dismissing the whole argument for various reasons and well their common denominator is often that they think that well the probability either of these scenarios materializing is super low and even if the probability were high then the probability would be low of uh, our our being successfully able to steer the development in any in any direction that we would prefer so yeah, some people say, well, the probability of, you know, any fears of goal misalignment applying is extremely low. Um, and the probability of goal alignment succeeding through sort of a strategic effort on our part is also extremely low. And from this, they conclude that, yeah, it's not a cause area worth pursuing in any uh, serious way. 
But sort of from a decision theoretic and philosophical point of view, I'd say, well, um, even, if, even if that's completely correct, if that were totally accurate, that let's say it, it were extremely unlikely that superintelligence would emerge at all or like very, very far into the future only. And if we also add that it's in any case extremely improbable that we would sort of succeed with a strategic effort to try and maximize the probability of an awesome, a utopian outcome, even if both of these points apply, well, the expected value could still be enormous. So it, even, even, even knowing that our deliberate effort at steering the development is unlikely to succeed, even if that were the case, the expected value of trying hard could still be high. So that's, I think, an important point to make from a sort of decision um, theoretic perspective. Um, and that brings me to the second but last slide already. Uh, what I've tried to do in this talk is give a brief intro, like a justification for the spirit of EA and an overview of uh, like main strategies and cause areas pursued. And last but not least, I'd like to mention some organizations and their websites if you're interested in, in checking out the material in greater detail. I uh, did mention GiveWell, um, the charity research think tank mainly focusing on the cause area of world poverty and global health. Then there's Giving What We Can, which is an organization where you can sort of take a pledge, take this 10% pledge that I mentioned, and several thousand people have already taken this pledge to donate 10% to the most effective cause areas they can find. There's 80,000 hours, the organization providing uh, career advice. In the German area, there's the Effective Altruism Foundation doing various things, also providing some career advice and donation advice. And for the cause area of AI safety specifically, there's the Berlin-based Foundational Research Institute, whose research you can check out, or uh, the US-based um, Machine Intelligence Research Institute, MIRI, which you may have heard of. Um, and uh, yes, so as I said, I'm a philosopher by training, but uh, you can find the computer science and machine learning literature by people who believe that this is an important cause area um, on these websites, for instance. And to conclude, so this is sort of the animating spirit behind all of these organizations, a keen awareness that this is probably in a very real and urgent sense the situation we are in globally. It may not feel that way evolutionarily because we are still running on sort of Stone Age brains and emotionally we have a hard time grasping the situation of a global village, which is really an interconnected global village. That's a historical first. And so emotionally, we're not really able to grasp that, but intellectually we are. And it's probably true that this is our situation. But it's also true that having a beer from time to time is supremely strategically important. We need to minimize burnout risk. And uh, yeah, the effective altruist communities all around the world are very welcoming. And there's also a community in, uh, in Zurich here pretty big community in uh, Switzerland and Germany. And yeah, if you're interested, these are also just the kind of people that uh, like to go grab a beer and, um, and have uh, philosophical and also technical uh, discussions. And with that being said, uh, thanks again for your interest and your attention. And I'm looking forward to your questions and, and comments. Great, thank you so much.